Hello, everybody. This is Phil Gorski. I'd like to welcome you to another Critical Realism Network webinar. This week, um, our guest will be Larissa Buchholz, uh, who received her PhD from Columbia before spending several years at the Harvard Society of Fellows and now uh, recently joining uh, the faculty at Northwestern University. Um, and um, some of you will know her as um, an up-and-coming network theorist and historical sociologist uh, who is uh, working on uh, a really path-breaking project on the global art field, uh, which uh, attempts to look at the development of uh, art markets uh, in, a, in a truly kind of global and, and transnational perspective. And um, she'll be talking to us a bit this week um, about um, how uh, that project is developed and how uh, critical realism uh, has has informed that project. So, uh, without further ado, I'll uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Larissa. Yeah, thanks very much, Phil, for the introduction and for inviting me to this webinar series, uh, which I have been following with great interest. Uh, I'm super delighted to present my work today as a part of it. So, in this lecture of I hope around 35 minutes, I plan to cover quite a bit of ground about issues revolving around transnational theorizing, taking field theory as an example. And so this will be not the typical talk with just one question and one answer. And to orient you, let me provide you first with an overview of what I'm going to cover. So in the following part, I begin to introduce you to distinctive challenges of transnational theorizing. And I also will talk about how critical realism might offer a good meta foundation to navigate them. And in this part, I also zoom into one strategy of theorizing that I argue is uh, useful for expanding concepts from national to transnational global levels and mainly analogical theorizing. In the second part, I outline how I used analogical theorizing to extend both your history regarding my research on contemporary art, so just mentioned it, and I elucidated how it guided the development of a new concept, namely relative vertical autonomy. And then in the third part, I will move from theorizing to theory more specifically and outline three advantages of relative vertical autonomy for the development of global field analysis. And lastly, after we have cleared quite a bit of ground about transnational theorizing and expanding field theory, I zoom out again to a greater meta level and will discuss why critical realism offers fertile tools for developing causal explanation in global field analysis or global sociology more generally. So we are set, and let's move to the first part on transnational theorizing. A key challenge in this regard is what the Australian sociologist Remy Collin tagged as the problem of northern reification in global sociology. With that, she denounced how Anglo-Saxon theorists approach transnational global dynamics by merely scaling up concepts from their own Western nation-state societies straight to the global level. Such an upscaling approach, Connell rightly claimed, would end up in world spanning generalizations from the one-sided vantage point of the global north and in turn produce a problematically reifying picture of the nature of global society. So while Connell's fervent critique tended on the first phase of empirically weakly grounded globalization theory from the 90s, her problematization of Northern reification points to a key question for theoretically motivated global scholars. To what extent and how can we transpose concepts that were developed for Western societies from a national to a global scale without falling prey to reification? What kinds of reflexivity and strategies are conducive to circumvent the threats of reductionist Norton theory? Carlo herself, as Isaac Reed observed, who is here also quoted, does not give us many clues in that direction. Her own suggestions concentrate on how to reconstruct the theoretical canon by bringing in the voices of the South. 
where such work of common reconstructions toward a more southern theory is surely important, Reed rightly pointed out that this does not complete the work. Northern reification must be tackled beyond canon construction and also with regard to the nut and bolt of research in global sociology, namely in regard to our ways of developing concepts, theories of the middle range, and causal explanations. And that is a level that I will address in this webinar. Of course, uh, I have to emphasize one webinar, one person cannot fully resolve the issue of Northern reification. That can, of course, only be a collective work in process, progress. But both Carl's critique and Reed's response make hopefully clear why it is important to engage with the question of theorizing in global sociology in distinctive ways. Why it entails distinctive challenges that have to be met with a distinctive kind of reflexivity. In that regard, um, I believe that critical realism offers a useful meta foundation for strategies of reflexive transnational theorizing in at least four ways. Before I go over them, let me just preface that I cannot cover all faces, nuances of critical realism here in this webinar. So if you are interested in more, interested in more background information, I highly recommend to move to this webinar, which I also listed on the slide. Okay, let's go back. The first advantages of critical realism is that it adheres to ontological realism. That means that it presupposes that the world exists independent of our concepts. And as a consequence, and here particularly relevant, the goal of theory should be to provide realistic accounts of the real world. That contrasts and turns with an approach that treats theories merely as heuristic devices or models. As Frederick Cunningham was a rightly pointed out in his webinar, for Jews' approach was ambivalent in that regard. However, if you want to go beyond Northern reification, ontological realism is an indispensable foundation for theorizing. Second, critical realism provides useful models of causal explanation for global sociology beyond the false idea of general laws, and I will elaborate on this part more in the fourth part of the webinar. Third, critical realism also provides a complex approach to emergence, that is, the idea that social entities are more than an aggregate of its parts. This matters for transnational theorizing because it lets us approach global configurations as more than just the sum of sub-entities, for example, nation states, and to acknowledge that they have distinctive emergent qualities and causal powers. I will get back to that also in the fourth part, and also would like to direct your attention to a webinar by Phil on the critical realism's approach to emergence. On fourth, lastly, uh, critical realism is a philosophy of social science that advocates methodological pluralism, which is, I believe, fertile for grasping the complexity in the social of the social in the global terrain. So let's just pause briefly. So far, I have provided a broader introduction on why we need to think hard about transnational theorizing and why I think that critical realism offers a useful meta foundation for it. Let's move on and uh, to a particular strategy of theorizing, namely analogical theorizing, which I want to argue is a useful a useful strategy for reflexive transnational theory development. And then I will demonstrate to you how I use this for extending field theory in the context of my research on contemporary art. First of all, analogical theorizing was pioneered by Dime Wan in the field of organizational sociology. And to elucidate it, let's define first analogy as a cognitive process of identifying structurally structural equivalencies among separate domains or parts. What one did with analogy is to use it for developing a method uh, for theory development through cross-case comparison. Okay, it sounds a little complicated. Let's first clarify what cross-case comparison means. 
It means that one compares cases that can vary in their size, function, or complexity. And a classic example in this regard is Goffman's concept of the total institution. It originated from field work at a mental hospital. Then he elaborated it further through cost case comparison with such diverse cases as prisons, army training camps, or boarding schools. So cost case comparison contrasts with same case comparison, which refers to similar cases such as social revolutions in different nation states, for example. Crucial is here that because analogical theorizing deals with cross-case rather than same-case comparisons, it also offers a method to move concepts across different scales. And analogical theorizing involves there will be thereby three basic moves. First, the analytical reduction of the theory to scale invariant properties. Second, analogical extension that is the move of concepts across cases or here level scales based on empirically identified equivalencies. And third, an analogical difference that is one searches if there are also important differences between the original case and the new one. The established analogy serves thereby as an analytical device to establish systematically differences against the background of similarities. And it is these differences that lead to theoretical innovation. So the central principle of theory extension for AT, analogical theorizing, is that not analogical similarity or in Bourdieu's vocabulary, the search for structural equivalence, but analogical difference. The use of analogy as a tool in cognitive process to systematically identify differences against the background of equivalencies. And in this context, it is also important to note that the moves of analytical reduction and extension are not merely you know, understood in a heuristic sense, but they are grounded in a realist ontology that is, they are anchored in the assumption that all forms of social organization, notwithstanding their variation in their size, complexity, and function, have certain features in common. They share basic characteristics of structure, such as hierarchy, division of labor, goals, or normative standards. And in addition, they also display similar processes, such as culture, socialization, conflict, competition, cooperation of power, etc. OK, so now we are ready to demonstrate analogical theorizing in action in regard to my work on the global art field. So I applied, used that to extend Bourdieu's theory from a national to a global level. And uh, before I go into the details, let's also first clarify why is it actually useful to use Bourdieu? What does he have to add to the field of global studies? And I think there are at least three broader reasons why it's it's really uh, useful to push towards the development of a global field analysis. First, uh, it offers an approach that goes beyond monolithic account of one overarching global economic or cultural system, which we have in world systems or world polity analysis, and instead uh, principally offers a framework to account for multiple differentiated transnational practice spheres that each revolve around their own logics. Second, the model is multidimensional. Uh, while, for example, world systems or world policy analysis are either materialist or culturalist, field analysis allows to account for both the material and cultural dimensions of transnational or global fields. And lastly, as I uh, seek to show in my book, the approach uniquely allows to examine transnational global process from different levels of analysis, namely the micro level of the agent's habits and strategies, the major level of field relations, and the larger micro level. Against this background, let's go back to our analogical theorizing and start with the movement of analytical reduction. To do so, uh, we first have to summarize how Bourdieu defined a social sphere as a field in the most elementary scale invariant sense. In this regard, I argue that the fundamental defining concept of a field is relative autonomy. Bourdieu's field essentially designate social spheres that dispose of relative autonomy. 
So, but what does he mean by autonomy? First of all, it's uh, derived from nomos and autos, which basically means a specific law, or I suppose you alternatively phrase it as specific logics. So, uh, and these logics refer for Robidoux particularly for specific logics of struggle or competition. He has a conflict oriented uh, approach, as we all know. That in itself is a bit vague, and reading the world of art, one can reconstruct three dimensions along which social fields adhere to their own specific law, namely at the level of distinctive ideology and belief, for example, the ideology of law polar in the modern art field, at the level of distinctive principles of hierarchization, that is a specific type of symbolic capital, and third, and that is often less recognized in Bourdieu's theory, relative autonomy is also manifested at the level of, of a specific set of organizations that embody a field's autonomous principles. But to make the understanding complete, we also have to realize that uh, autonomy is only relative. There is no complete closure. Fields are subjected to external influences, albeit to what uh, what Bourdieu calls refraction, and a field's autonomy is always historically variable. So autonomy is not complete, but relative. Taken together, a field can be basically defined as a space of specialized practices with a relatively autonomous logic of competition along the three dimensions. Now, to what extent, we go back to our crucial uh, questions here in this webinar, to what extent can we transpose this concept to a global field? If you look at the emerging yet still sparse literature on transnational global fields, we can see that scholars have moved the idea of relative autonomous spaces productively to a global level. For example, Johan Heilbronn did so for the global field of book translation, or Monica Krause did so in her marvelous book on the global field of humanitarian intervention. So what changes in these cases is the scale. A global field, in this sense of analogical extension, that becomes a globally extended space of specialized practices with a relatively autonomous logic of competition. In my research on the contemporary visual arts in a global context, Bourdieu's idea of relative autonomy was useful to extend as well. Nonetheless, just extending the basic model proved insufficient to account for all features of the art field at the global level. And one important feature was its inherently multi-scholar architecture. This becomes especially this became especially clear when I examined the emergence of the global art field. Here, the main axis of differentiation was not so much how the global art field became differentiated from other field types, which is the global economic field. Uh, instead, I realized that I needed to account for a second axis of differentiation, namely how the global art field constituted itself by becoming relative autonomous from the logic of national art fields, that is, a vertical axis of autonomous differentiation. In this case, however, the autonomy criterion assumed a new direction and meaning. Rather than applying to functionally different spheres of practice, it relates to different levels on which fields operate. Thus, grappling with my data through analogical theorizing led me to distinguish between two kinds of autonomy. And here you see a more technical graph of my model. First, functional autonomy, which corresponds to the meaning in which Bourdieu has introduced it. And uh, I have to emphasize I'm saying functional, not functionalist. And second, vertical autonomy, which accounts for the relative autonomy among field levels of social organization in the same space of practice. So with vertical autonomy as a so, so, so to speak anal an analogical difference that I encountered, the original definition of a global field has to be extended. It includes also the criterion of vertical autonomy from lower field levels. So this extended definition, we can take into account that the global field level is not just the sum of national fields, but is marked 
by relatively autonomous structures, beliefs, and stakes independent from national states. More specifically, moving to the third part of the webinar, I argue that the idea of vertical autonomy offers at least three contributions for the development of global field analysis. First, it contributes to theorizing the emergence of certain, emergence of certain global fields that are embedded in a multi-level structure. With vertical autonomy, we can acknowledge that emergence involves not just functional autonomy, not just the change of scale, but vertical differentiation of global logics of competition and structuration, as I said before. In my research on the art field, I thereby identified three mechanisms of global field emergence, uh, which I conceptualize as vertical autonomization. So the first is the construction of globally integrated institutional circuits for sustained cross-border flows and competition. In my case, the most important were the global art biennial circuit at the cultural pool on the global art auction market at the commercial pool. A second mechanism consisted in the construction of a global gaze to the rise and transformation of field-specific global discourse, uh, which uh, unfolded over a period of 30 years, and there were quite some interesting mutations to observe. I'm happy to speak about that in the discussion if you're interested. And finally, um, a third mechanism rested in the rise of new institutional practices of classifying and assessing artistic recognition and value in global terms, notably in the rise of uh, worldwide artist rankings, which established, in a sense, a specific type of global symbolic capital. So taking together these three mechanisms, um, the establishment of a global art infrastructure, the cultural construction of a global gaze, and the institutionalization of new global practices of evaluation, contributed to the emergence of a global field the, in the contemporary Russian arts as a vertically autonomous space vis-a-vis -vis the logic of national art fields that reaches across six continents. Second, the idea of relative vertical autonomy also offers a conceptual basis from which we can theorize relations between global and national field levels in ways that avoid symbol dualism, an issue that has been long and widely problematized in the globalization literature. As the relativity of field autonomy suggests that national and global field levels are only partially independent, we must approach them by the same token as still relatively interdependent. Thus, the idea of relative vertical autonomy allows to grasp global and national field levels as simultaneously distant, distinct, and entangled, as independent and interdependent, beyond any dualistic or even zero sum terms. Specifically, as I outlined in my article, vertical autonomy allows us to theorize both the degree and the modalities of global national interdependencies. For reasons of time, I focus here only on the second, on the modalities. Central is here the notion that relatively autonomous fields are affected by other fields or the broader environment only indirectly, namely what Bourdieu's calls refraction. I mentioned that earlier. In this sense, uh, vertical autonomy helps us to keep in mind that the global is filtered through the national. It affects the national only to the extent that it becomes refracted like a prism to the national field specific characteristics. Let me give you an example from my research. I found that in the, uh, regarding the multi-million auction rights of Chinese contemporary art in the new millennium, I found out that it had to be explained by the way in which vertical autonomous field levels interacted in the market. Here you see a scheme from another uh, working paper that is under review in which I developed the idea of a multi-scholar status market based on different vertically autonomous levels, including also the regional level. There's also a reference and an abstract in case you're interested. 
Uh, but let's focus here just on the global national interaction. So I found that global record sales have been sacrificed on the market rise of Chinese contemporary art, also in the national field, uh, specifically in regard to mainline auctions. But these feedback effects had to be understood against the background of national market junctures and investment cultures, particularly uh, a crisis of the traditional painting segment, which pushed investment-oriented buyers, which had long disdained the contemporary art genre in China, to reorient themselves in the first place and also jump on the Chinese contemporary art uh, boom. But vertical autonomy is also useful when one inverts the vector of analysis to acknowledge how the global constitutes itself through a set of reflections of the national. An example in my research is the emergence of so-called global styles, like global pop art. It is not something globally homogeneous, but an aesthetic ideal for diverse reflections of national traditions. Here, the German, Indian, Russian, Chinese are presented on the pictures. Lastly, uh, vertical autonomy also helps us to think about the microstructure of global fields in refined terms. Roger and Casanova, Pascal Casanova, who was, by the way, a, a, really a pioneer in the development of global field analysis, argued that uh, global fields are structured around a macro hierarchical structure that is defined by the distribution of various forms of so called national capital. Vertical autonomy contributes to refine this idea. First, it helps to identify well, which global fields will need such a macrostructure in the first place, namely only those that are multi-level. And that are not all global fields. For example, uh, Monica Grouse's global field of humanitarian in intervention evolved without an association to national fields at the beginning. Uh, it also, let's go back, uh, vertical autonomy also helps to specify what is actually meant by national capital, namely only those macro-level national resources that constitute structural asymmetries at a global level of competition, that is, at a vertically, relatively autonomous field level. For example, to account for the unequal institutional macro-structure in the global art field, I did not measure all institutions of the national field. I focused only on the distribution of transnational art institutions and national fields, because it is these that count for asymmetries in global competition. So by implication, in this sense, vertical autonomy contributes to denational borders in Casanova's original formulation of national capital. Macro-level global hierarchies are not a simple reflection of national-level hierarchies. Okay. We have completed the third part, and now we are ready to jump into the last, into the fourth part. Let me just reiterate, I uh, said some uh, things about transnational theorizing, how critical realism contributes to it, and then explained uh, why I think analogical theorizing is a useful strategy for uh, transnational theorizing as well. I applied this strategy to develop, show you how I developed the concept of vertical autonomy, and then I elucidated how this concept contributes to the development of global field analysis. Now let's go to the final section, which is basically about the question of causal explanation and uh, how critical realism offers useful tools for approaching it in global field analysis or global sociology more broadly. Um, I will focus here mainly on discussing its mechanistic approach to causal explanation. There are different versions also within critical realism, but my focus is on the mechanistic side. To understand the latter advantages, uh, let me first highlight some general versions of mechanistic models in contrast to the positivist idea of general laws. And, um, I will then move to compare critical realist model of mechanistic explanation with analytical sociology. So uh, the positive general laws model holds a regularity view of causation. That means it associates causation with a constant conjunction between observable events. 
causal relationships in this sense is defined by two basic criteria, temporal order and regularity. Whenever event A occurs, B should follow. Thus, a proper causal explanation in the positivist sense requires the search for constant conjunction, which, in turn, are to be expressed as covering or general laws that mean a universal statement. Mechanism-based models of causal explanation challenge this positivist approach on at least two common fronts. First, they persist that the mere conjunction of events A and B represents an insufficient criterion for a causal relationship, regardless of how constant this conjunction may appear. What is left open is how A and B are indeed causally connected. Thus, the idea of a mechanism is entered as a third mediating explanatory element to provide the analytical bridge that allows to distinguish between statements of correlation and causation. And as such, a mechanistic model principally foregoes the pitfall of causal reification. But more important, this commitment to specifying the mediating causal process entails a second critique of the positivist model, namely the latter's belief in the generality of causal relationships, that is, in the belief in general laws. In neurological terms, the addition of a third mediating element implies that the same observed conjunction between A and B can be rooted in very different causal processes. For example, while one might observe an almost universally strong association between gender and income inequality worldwide, there is no reason to believe that the mechanisms that connect gender differences and income inequality are the same in the Middle East, Northern Europe, or Latin America. So the threefold structure of mechanism-based models of explanation principally guards against the fallacy to mistake uniform correlations for uniform causal relations. By its very logical structure, the mechanism-based approach offers thus a context-sensitive model of causal explanation. And when we do the circle back to global sociology, such context sensitivity is critical to avoid northern reductionism. Keeping with the model of general laws by contrast would imply a blank check for northern reductionism that is for problematically projecting causal laws from the western metropolises to the entire globe. So we are better off with mechanistic models to prevent false causal universalism. Lastly, let me explain why within the pool of mechanistic models, and there is quite a heterogeneous pool, a critical realist perspective has unique advantages for global research, particularly when compared with analytical sociology, another realistic approach to mechanistic explanation. For doing so, we first have to understand how their different models are tied to different ideas of causation. Analytical sociology adheres to a notion of causation as counterfactual dependency. This conception modifies the regularity view of causation by substituting the criterion of regularity with that of necessity. Accordingly, a cause is not just that which comes first, but that which must come first in the sense that had it not come first, the consequent effect would not have followed. And quote your root graph. So that is the notion of counterfactual dependency that you introduce a notion of necessity in explaining a sequence. Despite this differentiation, analytical sociology's model of mechanistic explanation remains thereby faithful to the assumption that causation should be defined by temporal order. A mechanism in this perspective provides the necessarily necessary link that holds an orderly sequence together. However, by relying on the idea of causation as order, analytical sociology's approach remains vulnerable to the fallacy of causal reification. Even when one deals with context-bounded rather than universal conjunctions, the problem of differentiating correlation and causation remains. 
This contrasts with critical realism's productive notion of causation, which allows to prevent causal reification. The productive notion suggests that the cause is not just something that holds the first position within the sequence of events, be it regularly or necessarily. A cause has, indeed, to cause something, which is to say, produce effect. Central in this context is critical realism's concept of causal power, being defined in basic terms as an entity's ability to do or act in one way or another. So this productive notion of causation, mechanisms represent no longer just miniaturized bounded conjunction episodes, rather they refer to causal processes that really produce the effect to be explained. Another advantage in contrast to analytical sociology is that critical realism integrates the role of emergent entity in its mechanistic model. So we can apply mechanisms also to macro-level configurations. And for this reason, it permits to account for the fact that the causal status of global configurations cannot be reduced to an aggregation of entities. I said this also in the beginning, be they organization, nation, state, or region, but uh, has to be really uh, taken as uh, emergent entities that have generally emergent qualities and causal power. But what critical realism offers tools to, in tools to integrate the role of emergent global entities for causal explanations, it does so without overestimating their relative causal power. The critical realist approach favors a multi-causal perspective that does not automatically privilege the global or the local. And as such, I argue, it enables to stay attuned to the actually existing, multifaceted, multi-layered complexity of the social and the global terrain. So we come to the conclusion, bringing it all together. As I said, this is a, a, a talk that covers quite a lot of ground. So first of all, I argue that analogical theorizing offers a reflexive strategy for transnational theorizing. Then I demonstrate its use in regard to the global field analysis and advocated that instead of asking what is a global field, we should ask what is different about global fields using the principle of analogical difference. And in my regard, I uh, pointed to vertical autonomy and the multi-scholar structure of certain fields. And lastly, I addressed critical realism's model of causal explanation and argued that it offers a fertile foundation for causal global field analysis or maybe more broadly, global sociology. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Larissa. That was really yeah. Thank you so much, Larissa. That was great. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, before we plunge into the Q and A, just uh, very very quickly, um, I know some folks are familiar with. Um, the way this works, but uh, if anybody out there is joining us for the first time, um, the way to ask a question is uh, via the question box rather than uh, the chat box. So um, please put, uh, hit the little button uh, for ask a question, and um, then I will uh, pass some of those on um, to uh, to Larissa. Um, so um, first question for you, Larissa. This is a, a historical question. Um, is why are you dating the emergence of the global field and art so late in history? I, I guess this, uh, the question is wondering um, why it is that you wouldn't think that there had already been a global art field at some earlier point in time. Yes, uh, that's a great question. And uh, yeah, for this one, perhaps if you have a little bit of background on how I distinguish all the international world and global fields. So the art field you know, in the modern sense, with the very beginning has been international. That is the point that Fuji hasn't really covered in his own work on the, in the world of art. So since modernity, art has been international and there have been international institutions like, for example, the Venice Biennial. But 
a global field, it doesn't equal an international field. And I make uh, a strong distinction in that regard. On the one hand, uh, global fields uh, differ from international fields in regard to just by their extension, yeah, by their degree of extension. We now have an art infrastructure and discourses that really address contemporary art in, in really a global scale. That means in regard to a scale of six continents. Secondly, uh, it's also a vertical autonomy that we have now a field. International fields are not as vertically autonomous. So the logic of national fields is much stronger towards the, 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 the international field level. But in global fields, there is uh, a, a stronger degree of differentiation that we have genuine global logics that are not reducible to national field logics. And making these distinctions that get us back to the historical facts. And I, I believe that 19, the late 1980s are really a period when the, the global differentiation really took off. And I outlined that a little bit with the three mechanisms. I do this more extensively in the book. Uh, there was really a kind of qualitative shift in regard to the, to the extension and to the uh, velocity also of cross-border flows and competition. And that reached its full uh, bloom, so to speak, in the new millennium. Since then, we can really see that we have an emerging global field. Thanks. Does it clarify your question, Phil? Yeah, I'm still here. So here is a, uh, here's a highly speculative question, just quickly following on from the last one. Um, Many political commentators think that we may be en entering into a post-global period or a period of um, renewed nationalism. And uh, I realize this is prognosticating about the future, which is something we're usually not that great about. Um, but do you see any potential for this kind of current populist, nationalist, political wave to disrupt or, or fragment or even um, destroy the global art field or other global cultural fields? That is a great question. So, so I think your question points just, uh, you know, one implicit assumption that has to be clarified is that uh, vertical autonomy or globalization are really historical processes that, that are contingent and that are, in principle, reversible. Yeah. So, in regard to the global art field, I don't see any any chance for reversion. We can observe maybe uh, certain changes in political uh, and legal restrictions in terms of you know the transfer of artworks across borders, in terms of how the art market becomes regulated. But we have a global infrastructure in place that is hard, hardly, like, hardly, very unlikely to, to go away. And uh, we also have um, established a certain global awareness and certain global value structures that are hardly to vanish. What we might see additionally, and there are also already so potential movements on the way, uh, is a kind of reactive accounts that emphasize, you know, more local identities in art, like we see new regionalisms, for example, in Asian contemporary art, or we see new nationalisms. So it's also a conflictual configuration, yeah, the global field that doesn't uh, go without any resistance. But in generally, I don't see that leaning in, in, in the long term. That is my prediction, so to speak. Thanks. That has opened up another really interesting set of questions, both empirical <laughs> and, and theoretical. Um, what, so the empirical question that I'll open with is, um, you know, I, I, is, this, is this question about the politics of scale, which you were just, just alluding to, um, I, I don't think that most political sociologists um, or historical sociologists are accustomed to thinking about this, even though it, it's tacit in a lot of the kinds of questions that we ask. So state building, uh, for example, is amongst other things 
um, an, an issue um, about scale, about um, which particular scale is, 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 going, to, is going to triumph. Um, the, the kind of theoretical question, though, that I really have for you, though, is, is this one about um, figuring out what scales are are are, are really really operating, so I, or what or, or what levels, uh, if you will, our our account needs to uh, to take into con into consideration. And let me try to just make this really really concrete because I'm curious to see. Um, how you sort of work through this yourself. So, um, you know, clearly at, at some point you uh, came to see that there were at least some things that were going on that required uh, a field in between the national and the global, which you sometimes talk about as, as regional. And so, I, I guess I have two, two questions. So, one is, um, what exactly was it that you saw? Um, you know, in your mm -hmm. in your data or your evidence that made you think, wow, I need to to attend to the to the regional scale. And then, um, how did you, in a sense, sort of come to the conclusion that this regional scale really was operating? Um, you know, what what was sort of criteria, tacit or uh, or explicit, did you you know informed your your judgment there? Wow, there are big questions. I could give another talk based on that. First of all, let me just preface the idea of a politics of scale and how field analysis contributes to it is also wonderfully outlined in the um, introduction by Julian Go, Monica Clausen, which I listed as one of the suggested readings. Yeah, so if people are interested, go to read that part uh, in my own work. So, um, I saw multiple field levels interacting, particularly when I examined the valuation of Chinese contemporary art. And let me explain that as briefly as I can. So I real when I traced how did Chinese contemporary art become, you know, integrated into the auction market, and how did it become so successful as it eventually became, I first saw that the whole um, integration started at the regional level. So through auction houses in Hong Kong, they started to market Chinese contemporary art. And at first in, in regard to an Asian identity and later in a more contemporary Western way. And auctioneers, seeing the success at the regional level, said, that, said, well, we have to jump to the global level and market it even more broadly in the more Western sense. And uh, at the global level, uh, then happened certain record sales that in turn had feedback effects on the regional market and the national market, the Chinese market. And they were each reflected. So what made me see that uh, the regional level is a distinctive level was to see, for example, how the uh, type of buyers were different and how the art was framed differently. So in regard to different, uh, um, you know, valuation discourses. At the global level, Chinese contemporary art is framed in regard to as part of Western contemporary, you know, now global contemporary art and expressing globalization. So it was very much framed to a Western audience. At the regional level, it was framed in regard, as I already indicated, but that was the same, to an Asian identity. Now Chinese contemporary art is art of part of Asian contemporary art. And at the national level, uh, the, I have found some really interesting discursive <laughs> uh, facts there. Uh, Chinese contemporary art was appropriated as part of expressing national identity, which was kind of paradoxical because a few years ago, they were really pariahs in the national political system. So the discourse data, for example, make it clear that there are distinct, you know, levels in terms of how how the art was framed, but also how the specialist, the auction specialist, thought about what is the audience to which we market, you know, how they how they thought and which kind of frames they thought in terms of positioning their art. Um, I hope that answers your question. So I on this basis I developed the idea of a multi scholar status market and that's a working paper that is under review at the moment. I hope this answers your complex question, Philip. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, that that's great. That's great. Um, 
I, I, why did you choose the word regional, though? Um, I mean, do you see um, the emergence of this region, this re, these regional scales, as as something that purely has to do uh, with space? In other words, it's just you know the area around Hong Kong, or or did it really? You you know, your statement seemed to imply that it was you know, partly, you know, linguistic, cultural, civilizational, something like that, so that, you know, you could talk, say, about a Western art field or an East Asian art field. Um, how did yeah. you how did you work that out? That's a wonderful question. I love it. So I use regional here in terms of, you know, in an emic sense, how the art uh, auction specialists themselves uh, conceive of their work. So they uh, conceive of the market in Hong Kong, and the auction houses in Hong Kong conceive of their range and scale mainly in regional terms. That means they cover a certain Asian regional audience. That doesn't mean that their sales are independent of global sales and global audiences or national audiences, but that is their primary focus, and that's how they approach their work. So I use the way how specialists themselves understood the scope of their work. So in a subjective sense, if you want if you want to say so. Here's a, here's another sort of related question that's come through, which is about the relationship of uh, the global art field that you describe and other global or possibly global fields of um, material cultural production. So, for example, mm -hmm. fashion or or textiles um, are these uh, are are these also uh, again just sort of curious, this is somewhat speculative since this isn't your research, but I'm I'm sure this must be something that you've uh, that you've thought about as as well whether there are uh, you know certain things that are specific about the art market which allowed it to become global or whether or whether there are things that differentiate it from other fields of global cultural production. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, one of the advantages, just to preface of, of field analysis, is that you really can make really interesting comparisons. You know, why does one field go global? How does it go global? And another doesn't necessarily do so. For example, I always like to compare the art field with uh, sociology or the, <laughs> the social science, the field of social science. So they are both, in a way, in a very broad sense, fields of cultural production, yeah, or intellectual production. But uh, whereas the global art, the art field has gone really global to a high extent. Uh, in the social sciences and sociology, we don't see that to the same degree. And we see that not, for example, in regard to citation patterns, which tend to be still quite nationalistic, it's national, especially in U.S. sociology. So there are differences, and it would be really fascinating to spell out why are there differences, maybe to arrive at a kind of comparative sociology of globalization, which Mario Gullen has, has propagated already uh, 15 years ago. Um, in my work, so you have to draw boundaries in what kinds of questions you address in your book and uh, in your work. And I mainly focus on the historical development of the global art field, and I do not take up a strongly comparative perspective. Fashion is certainly an important factor, especially if you look at development in the market pole of the global art field. So also, you know, the uh, mass media and the celebrity culture, these things factor in. But I wouldn't say that I do a systematic comparison with other fields. That would just go beyond the scope. But it's useful to conduct that in the future. So thanks for the question. So uh, another question comes in here about um, to Souza Santos's um, epistemologies of, of the South, um, where uh, he really argues against the extension of uh, critical sociological theories themselves as being too Euro or Western centric, um, and asks uh, sociologists to uh, take up a rearguard disposition of following and cataloging theories and currents of the global South. Um, which he seems to be, which he seems to be somewhat inspired by, by Latour, and 
um, I, I I wonder how you would respond to uh, to to somebody like like D'Souza, uh, you know, insofar as um, you know your your approach seems to be more um, you know the one that he seems to be opposing, which is extending uh, Bourdieu's critical sociological theory. Is that uh, yes. does that does that feel like a criticism that hits home or? Um. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so my approach to transnational theorizing is probably more reformist than revolutionary. And as I said in regard to Ryan Connell at the beginning, and also referencing Isaac Reed's wonderful, thoughtful piece, um, I think if we just reconstruct the canon or replace Norton theory by a thousand theory and Norton epistemology by a thousand epistemology, that doesn't necessarily uh, lead to a road of success. Of course, uh, we should take into account uh, critical voices from the South and that should happen in a more, you know, more often. But at the same time, uh, you know, Certain global configurations really are still ta emerged out of certain Western configurations, for example, global sport, contemporary art. So it would be just not wise to dismiss all the resources that we have built up in, you know, the Western sociological tradition. So my approach is more reformist. I'm not criticizing the Sousa. I think it's a very uh, important voice, but my approach is a different one. Thanks. We now have another question um, regarding um, how you define uh, the global field. Um, is one of the qualitative characteristics you are using to distinguish international from global the use of a second level simulacrum, a symbolic representation of a representation for more local, national, or regional artifacts? That is, the development of a separate level of textual criticism that empowers itself and its users. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the question? So Hello? I think, yeah, so I think the question goes to the way, it, it, it's somebody asking for clarification about the way in which um, you distinguish the international from the global. Um, uh, and the question is whether the, the distinguishing characteristic is a use of a, of a second order simulacrum, uh, you know, which say a okay. separate level of textual criticism. Okay. Wow. This is an interesting question. So uh, the, the differentiation of the international and the global. So uh, as I said before, one of the differentiations is that we have a global scope, a scope in which uh, discourse, you know, references, is in which art is referenced. And that's what I discovered, you know, emerged only in the 1980s. And in, in a quite interesting, you know, not straightforward way, I can just outline the, the movement quickly. Um, and then, at the other hand, you know, Again, in terms of the MAQs, people address themselves in global terms now and not international ones. So it's also how people themselves use categories, international versus global. If you talk about the dis distinguishing of the uh, in qualitative terms, I'm not sure I understand this Monagua idea. So if the person would like to write me about that, I would love to correspond about it. So here I have the discourse of development. So, uh, as I said, one of the mechanisms for the emergence of a global field is the discourse, a field-specific global discourse, which uh, in the global art field, natural construction of what I call a global gaze. And let me just outline the movement. So, first, towards the end of the 1980s, debates on multiculturalism and post-colonialism introduced global concepts into the art field, primarily as a normative topic from which to criticize at times vehemently Eurocentric perspectives in Western contemporary art in its institutions. Then, in the late 1990s, the global became additionally associated with debates on actual ongoing globalization in contemporary art. So, the global art discourse came to both express 
and contribute to growing awareness of a globally expanding institutional context, such as the art biennials. So, so intermediaries and artists now talk about, ah, oh, we have a globalized globalization going on in contemporary art. What does this actually you know, mean for us, and, and et cetera. And then finally, at the beginning of the new millennium, the global assumed a greater taking for granted status. And that's the decisive move. More and more agents began to believe in the global as an actually existing imminent condition for contemporary art. So it was no longer a question whether contemporary art is global or not. Yeah? There were certain things in place that people said, yes, it also has a global scope. And uh, what also happened at the time, and that was really fascinating for me to discover in my discourse analysis, was that from that time on, we see the proliferation of new unifying modes of institutional and artistic classification, such as global art world, global art market, global art, global style, or global artist. So we see new categories emerging that express a certain global awareness and reflexivity that wasn't in place before. So that was the kind of evolution of discourse, which I uh, based my uh, emergence of a global field thesis on as one mechanism. Thank you. Okay, Larissa, so now, now I get to sort of indulge and ask a couple of questions which I've been really heavily dying to ask you the, the, uh, since early in the presentation. Um, I, I, thought the present, I thought the summary that you gave of, of analogical reasoning was really good. I've, I've heard you um, talk about this on, on several occasions, and I, I found this just really, really, really clarifying. Um, in these three steps: the um, analytical reduction, then uh, cross-case comparison, and then finally this uh, this act of kind of re reformulation, looking for for the disanalogies, if you if you like. Um, so. I've got two questions here, and I'll, I'll start off with the with the more with the more concrete one, which is which is about analytical reduction. Um, so how how does one one go about that, and um, how is one justified in um, in doing that? So is it is it a, a kind of a typological procedure of some kind, or I mean, you you know, you seem to be inspired by this. Uh, if I heard, was um, understanding you correctly, a little bit by Bourdieu talking about these structural invariants that you find in social fields, right? All mm -hmm. social fields have these basic properties. Was that sort of the model for you in thinking about what an, an analytical reduction is or how it works? Yeah. So uh, there is some equivalency with uh, Bourdieu structurally equivalent, searching for structural equivalence. So yes. So the, the process of analytical reduction is the attempt to reduce a concept to scale invariant property. And I wouldn't say that this is just, you know, a heuristic and typological because we still remain in the realm of the real. We, we just try to find what are the basic properties of a concept yeah, that, you know, like the art field, for example, yeah? What are its basic properties that are not tied to a particular scale that we could principally also find at other scales, yeah? And as I said in the talk, the, this idea that we can do that to reduce the scale invariant properties that can then be moved is based on the assumption that in reality, we have scale invariant properties in social configurations, such as properties of structures or certain processes going on. And um, so uh, that, but that, so let me just give you an example, for example, in, in the, the modern art field, yeah? So we know that uh, Bourdieu defined fields as relatively autonomous from their environment. Yeah, that's a very basic description. In terms of a historically situated field like the modern art field, he conceptualized this environment with regard to the field of pop in France. Yeah, that was his contextualization, historically scale specific contextualization. If you want to use the concept for the, the, the process of analogical theorizing, 
you have to strip this kind of specification away and really move to the, the basic invariant properties before you can move it across. So, and so I did not factor in the field of power when I moved the field concept to the next level. Then I reduced it and then to move it to the next level. I hope that's sufficiently clear. Yeah, no, that, that was that was very helpful, especially the idea of, of scale scale invariance was helpful for me in in, mm -hmm. um, in understanding what you what you were up to there. Um, though I wonder whether there not might not be other kinds of um, analytic reduction, which would be looking for other kinds of invariance, right? Um, mm -hmm. Other, as it were, other kinds of contact in insensitivity, if you, if you like. Um, and maybe a, so. Another way of uh, another one way of thinking about this, uh, George Steinmetz and I have been saying for several years now, without really doing it, that we were going to write some kind of a paper on real types. And yes, I yes, I remember something like what what you're you're describing, right? So I mean, the, the, what you're describing is one kind of real typological procedure, which is you know where you're looking for some some kind of set of uh, some kind of set of entities and relations that create certain kinds of powers and processes that uh, seem relatively invariant across across different kinds of scales. But you know, one could presumably also look for similar kinds of invariance that would um, that would work across other you know other offer other sort of structural differences. Um, but that's a, that's of course just a promissory note that uh, that we've never really never really delivered on up until now. Let me kind of close yeah. out our dis discussion with a with a with a different question. I, I I don't know that you whether you've thought about this. I mean, I certainly haven't thought through it myself carefully. But um, you know, as you know, um, Stefan Timmermans and Ido Tavori have written this book on abductive analysis. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. of neo-pragmatists talk about abduction. This is something yeah. um, which also gets talked about um, in some of the critical realist methodological textbooks, like uh, you know Baird Donemark's book. And um, I've never been myself totally clear on what the difference is between analogical and abductive reasoning, or whether there is any difference between abductive mm -hmm. and analogical reasoning. And um, I, I wonder if, if this is something that you might have given some thought to? Well, it's definitely something I'm working on uh, because I plan to, you know, to work out a, a paper on transnational analogical theorizing and I definitely have to factor in abduction and, you know, specify where I see the differences and where I see also convergences because there are some similarities. Um, uh, let me work out the paper and then you know more. <laughs> so uh, I'm great. I, so, I will well, we, this. Yeah, that's great. I mean, we you know we re, we really look, we really look forward to that. I think it's uh, it's an important topic, and um, you've made some really great contributions already in this area of uh, analogical reasoning, which I found personally very clarifying um, and making explicit certain kinds of theoretical operations that uh, reasoning operations that we often use without really being able to sort of name or systematize them so I think that really is a great contribution and of course we're all above all looking forward to your, your book on uh, development of the of, of the global art field so uh, you know on behalf of the network and um, all of our listeners today let me just thank you for such a such a clear and systematic and, and stimulating presentation um, and then let me just very close with um, a couple of very quick announcements. I mean, one, the first is um, to uh, encourage uh, anybody out there who has not already done so to um, consider submitting um, a uh, paper proposal or a panel proposal uh, for our uh, conference this summer on uh, post-positivist sociology. Uh, that conference is going to take place in Montreal uh, in uh, the second weekend in August, immediately before the beginning of ASA, and uh, I should add that uh, we have fairly generous um, 
uh, stipends for uh, for those whose proposals are accepted, and those can be either papers uh, or panels. But uh, if you are going to do that, please do it soon. We are starting to close in on the, on the deadline for that. And then I also want to invite all of you uh, to our our next webinar, uh, which is really uh, which, which will be uh, taking place uh, next month, really three weeks from now, and that'll be on ethnography and critical realism. Uh, with Claire Dakota from the University of Illinois, Chicago. So uh, once again, thank you, Larissa, and thanks to, to all the thank folks you. who are uh, out there listening. Um, and uh, we hope to see you again in a couple weeks.